Who, who, who did they have doing all the talking? The two women, and there was a, a man, and he seemed to be maybe of Arab descent or Middle Eastern or something like that. And the two women were white women, white women right? Um, there were other people of color in, involved in the in the thing, but they didn't speak. So I find it very interesting. It's just something that triggered something for me. Um, one thing that, that is interesting about the aces, the aces ask uh, they ask questions a little bit differently. So typically, what we talk about when we have people who are are coming to us with some kind of neurotic behavior that have, you know, Adlerian neurosis, right, which is that gap between what, um, how you are and the goal you're trying to accomplish and not being able to do so is, is neuroses. Uh, so we ask, what is wrong with you? And most practitioners ask that question, what is wrong with you? What's the underlying assumption of asking what is wrong with you? That there's something wrong with you. That, that you, in fact, are broken, right? Um, the ACE study, though, asked, "What has happened to you?" Which I think is an important question, because what's the underlying, what's the underlying message or the underlying philosophy in, in asking, "What has happened to you?" You're not. It's not your fault. A is not your fault, and second, what? So, so something did happen to you, so it's not your fault, and you are not broken. What's the good thing about people not believing that they're broken? That they uh, have the choice or empowerment to, to change where the situation they're in. Right? So that they can change the situation that they're in. And whether they can do it on their own, or they have to reach for a higher power, um, to, to connect with a community or, or however it is that they have to take action to, to heal themselves or, or join a healing community, but it, it is something that is in, within their control, right? So, so they have the ability to do, do that. Um, and passed on to him. And um, the lady mentioned that she didn't want certain behaviors passed on to her son, um, which I think is interesting because there's a couple of things. One, she can make those choices to not pass those things along, but she also has to change the environment that, or, or the context that makes it acceptable for a son to have those types of behaviors. Um, so, so there's that. Um, but, but one of the things that ACEs study doesn't necessarily talk about in, in great t detail is this particular concept um, that Poverty is where a lot of those, those indicators pop up more frequently than in neighborhoods or in communities where poverty is less. I'm not saying that uh, parents don't get divorced. I'm not saying that kids don't um, get sexually abused in more affluent neighborhoods or communities. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen because it does. But what I am saying is that the resiliency and the, the factors for support in those environments lend themselves for people being able to bounce back from that adversity either faster, stronger, and in some ways um, have better coping mechanisms than folks who live in, in, in poverty. So, um, so the, that's problematic. So this is a documentary from PBS. It's called Unnatural Causes, and the, the, the key question is, is this. Is inequity making us sick? And so we'll watch just a couple of episodes of this um, and then have some more uh, conversation and then I want to pass some stuff out. Again, these, these are things that are going to impact our, our clients um, both on a macro level and on a micro level. So here we go. <coughs> There's one view of us as biological creatures that we are determined by our genes, that what we see in our biology is somehow innately us because of who we were born to be. 
What that misses is that we grow up and develop. We grow up as children, we grow up as adults and continue. We interact constantly with the world in which we are engaged. That's the way in which our biology actually happens. We carry our history in our bodies. How else could, how could we not? Living in America should be a ticket to good health. We have the highest gross national product in the world. I'm very happy to finally have some of my cars in one location. Some of them. We spend two trillion dollars per year on medical care. That's nearly half of all the health dollars spent in the world. But we've seen our statistics. We live shorter, often sicker lives than in any other industrialized country. We rank 30th in life expectancy. Especially of economically developed countries, we are at the bottom of the list. A higher percentage of our babies die in their first year of life than in Cuba, Slovenia, Estonia. How can this be? Is this just because 47 million of us have no health insurance? Healthcare can deal with the uh, diseases and illnesses, but a lack of healthcare is not the uh, cause of illness and disease. It's like saying, since uh, aspirin cures uh, a fever, that uh, lack of aspirin must be the cause of a fever. Or is it mostly because of our American diet and personal health behaviors? Those behaviors themselves in part determined by economic status. And so our ability to avoid smoking and eat a healthy diet depends in turn on our access to income, education, and what we call the social determinants of health. But wouldn't our genes trump social determinants of health? Among twins who live together until age 18, who basically grew up in the same households, so had at least a relatively similar exposure. If they diverged later in life, if one became professional and the other was working class, they ended up with different health status as adults. This is among identical twins. Written into our bodies is a lifetime of experience, shaped by social conditions and policies that can determine who will be sicker, who will die sooner. There are ways in which our society is organized that are bad for our health. Uh, and there's no doubt that we could reconfigure ourselves in ways that would benefit our health. There are huge inequalities in the society. All this wealth is maldistributed. Pet food, ice for the pets, water. And I think that's in part why the U.S. as a whole has relatively poor health amongst the rich countries and why even the better off people are suffering. And we think that that is not inevitable. Unnatural causes. Is inequality making us sick? Coming to PBS 2008. Several years ago, two physicians in Chicago set out to solve a mystery. Why do African American women have babies that are born too small at twice the rate of white American women? Richard David and James Collins are neonatologists, pediatricians who specialize in the care of infants who come into the world too early or dangerously underweight, and often both.
like virtually everyone in their field, they were troubled by the striking racial differences in rates of premature and low birth weight babies. What could account for the differences? I originally thought that the disparity in premature delivery was really driven by socioeconomic differences between African Americans and whites. It is well known that African Americans have a lower collectively uh, socioeconomic status than whites and less likely to receive college education um, than whites. So I thought once you correct it for that, that the gap would go away. But Collins and David discovered the gap didn't go away. We were very surprised to find that the gap actually widened as education and socioeconomic status improved. And then began to look at it from a bigger perspective, and broader perspective, and really started to realize, well, maybe it's something about lifelong minority status, which is the driving factor here. There's something about growing up as a black female in the United States that's not good for your childbearing health. I don't know how else to summarize it. So the two neonatologists began to explore whether being a member of a particular minority group might affect pregnancy outcomes, and they came up with a controversial hypothesis. What's behind the low birth weight and premature birth for African-American babies is the unequal treatment of African-Americans in American society. In other words, racism is taking a heavy toll on African-American children even before they leave their mother's wombs. It's an idea that's slowly gaining acceptance. We're in the midst of a paradigm shift. 15 years ago, racism as a risk factor was almost never heard of in a scientific paper, whereas now it's much more a possibility. The story of Kim Anderson, a successful Atlanta executive and lawyer, illustrates exactly what David and Collins are talking about. We know that a healthy lifestyle should lead to a healthy baby. Women who eat well, exercise, get prenatal care, avoid alcohol and drugs and cigarettes, are more likely to have a good pregnancy. But one of the best predictors for a healthy pregnancy outcome is higher education. This is a picture of me in May 1984 when I graduated from Columbia Law School. People think I'm living the American dream. I'm a lawyer with two cars, two and a half kids, and the dog, the porch. A good husband, great family. I've always been lucky to have good health. Always ate well, exercise, never smoke. So when we look at Kim Anderson, a well-paid lawyer in good health, we would expect her newborn to be a healthy, full-term baby. It didn't turn out that way. Back in 1990, when she was pregnant with her first child, Kim went into labor two and a half months early. I just wanted to know at least that if she was born alive, that at least we had a fighting chance. So I heard her cry, thank God. But she was so small, I mean, you could like, hold her in the palm of your hand. Kim's baby, Danielle, weighed only two pounds, 13 ounces when she was born. She joined the ranks of almost 300,000 low birth weight infants born in the U.S. that year. About one out of every 14 babies all of them at a high risk of dying before their first birthday. I remember getting home and being in the bathroom just, I fell apart. You know, because it's like I didn't get to take my baby home, you know. I remember just sort of falling apart. Preterm and low birth weight are the leading reasons that the U.S. claims the dubious distinction of having one of the worst infant survival rates in the industrialized world. We fall behind dozens of countries. Babies born in Slovenia, Cyprus, Malta, and Croatia stand a better chance of living to the age of one than a baby born here. It is kind of like the canary in the mine. It's the most sensitive of our health outcome indicators per population. And infant mortality is not just a problem for African Americans. White Americans, if they were a separate country, would still rank 23rd in the world. 
So outcomes are very bad. The biggest myth about racial ethnic disparity in, in, in infant mortality is that people think that this has to do with just socioeconomic and, uh, and, and that the disparities are really the consequences of racial differences in socioeconomic status. And it isn't that, that simple. Infant mortality among white American women with a college degree or higher is about four deaths per thousand births. But among African American women with the same level of education, infant mortality is about 10 per thousand births, almost three times higher. In fact, African American mothers with a college degree have worse birth outcomes than white mothers without a high school education. Think about this. We're talking about African American doctors, lawyers, and business executives, and they still have a higher infant mortality rate than non-Hispanic white women who never went to high school in the first place. So, so what I've been calling uh, for a, a rethinking of an old poem uh, uh, from a new perspective, uh, and uh, uh, to, to really rethink racial and ethnic disparities in birth outcomes from a life course perspective. And simply put, the, the life course perspective posits that birth outcomes are the product of not simply the nine months of pregnancy, but really the, the consequences of differential exposures across the life course of women of color. We know that racism is, is stressful, and we know that, that that stress can impact on health uh, in many different ways. Uh, it creates this chronic wear and tear on your body systems to, to adapt. It wears on the hormonal system, it wears on the, the immune inflammatory functions, it, it, it wears on your metabolic functions. And, and over time, it creates an overload on all of these organs and systems so that they no longer function optimally. Everyday racism is like gunning the engine of a car without ever letting up. In fact, people who've looked at blood pressures, measuring ambulatory blood pressures for white folks and black folks, young folks, see that the blood pressures might be the same during the day, but at night the white, blood, white folks' blood pressures would drop and the black folks' blood pressures would stay the same. And so it is. It's like gunning the engine of that car, just wearing it out, wearing it out without rest. And I think that the stresses of everyday racism are doing that. And then if you were to carry that into the pregnancy, and that gets embedded in both the pregnancy physiology of the mother and the development biology of the child. Australia has done a lot in terms of increasing access and utilization of prenatal care, uh, especially amongst uh, communities of color, and yet we've done very little to reduce the maturity rates. I think that the problem is that you know, with prenatal care, you're trying to cram all these two things into less than line with prenatal care, and then expecting everything to turn out all right in the end, and to expect prenatal care in less than nine months to, to reverse all the cumulative uh, disadvantages and iniquities that's been carried forth over a life course of differential exposures is probably expecting too much of prenatal care. There's one particular piece I wanted to show. Um, so if we're serious about improving birth outcomes and reducing disparities, we got to start taking care of women before pregnancy. And I'm not just talking about that one visit three months preconceptionally, I'm talking about when she's a baby inside her mother's womb, but it's now an infant and a child and an adolescent and that Well, there's a lot of uh, uh, debate and conversation uh, currently, uh, currently looking at the role of genetics and environment in the problem that we see with diabetes in American Indian communities. So, for example, diabetes was exceedingly rare prior to damming the rivers in Arizona. There was actually a fairly complete health survey done uh, right around the, the 1900, early 1900s. And what they found was one documented case of diabetes among southwestern tribes. So it was not a, a, a common 
health problem historically when people lived in a different environment and had different lifestyles. Then what we saw was damming the rivers in the 1920s and 1930s. And then by the 1970s, some of the local tribes had the highest rate of diabetes in the world. So we did not see a tremendous genetic shift between 1900 and 1970. What we saw was a tremendous change in environment and lifestyle. So when we look at the allocation of resources, again, looking at this from a policy perspective, we will work with some communities and spend many, many millions of dollars on genetics research in those populations and at the same time, we won't spend $40,000 for a PE teacher. So we haven't prioritized the allocation of resources to reflect the needs of the communities. We've allocated resources to reflect the needs of policymakers and the medical research community. And this really is a social injustice. But looking at it from a broader perspective, we're seeing an explosion of type 2 diabetes around the world. It's not just American Indians. Uh, it's not just in this country, but in the whole world, in developing populations. What we've seen is a tremendous change in diet and processed foods and things like corn syrup, which makes the availability of sugar that much greater in processed foods. And as a result, we're seeing a tremendous increase of diabetes throughout the world. And that certainly is not genetic. The world has plenty of healthy food, we just don't distribute it equally. And the people who do not have access to healthier choices are the people and the populations that are suffering the most from diabetes. Diabetes is one of the, uh, the big problems that we're seeing among our older population. I think the reason why we have this problem, it has to do with the, our lifestyle and also the kind of food that we have right now. Because uh, in the past, we used to uh, just grow our food, you know. We had fresh fruit, and everything was fresh. But right now, most of our food are imported. So all we have to do is go out to the, the store and we we'll buy them and bring them in. So the basic point is what? What 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 was the point of being sure that those clips? Racism has a long term effect physically. Yep. Yep. There's a long term effect physically. What else? So the Native Americans, they weren't suffering from necessarily racism. What was Policy. also contributing? Policies right, and changing their environment, and changing um, how folks how folks live, bringing them better things, you know, corn syrup for the Marshall, in the Marshall Islands was, was, was problematic. So the environment that folks are in can also be uh, impactful. Um, so I'm going to make sure that I give you this. Um, I don't know that this is still online or not. called Speak Up, and it's from the Southern Poverty Law Center. And it's practical action steps that you can take to, to speak up in the face of uh, 
discrimination and, uh, and bigotry. So it's a very, very much an action-oriented guide. Um, it's broken into three sections. Uh, what can you do with your family? What can you do with your friends? What can you do at work? What can you do at school? And what can you do out in the community? So those are the, the sections. And I apologize for them being smaller. When I went to print them, I thought they would come out a little larger. They did. So, um, but this is at the, uh, the Poverty Law Center or teachingtolerance.org, or it may have just, it may now just be tolerance.org. And, uh, and this is under their publications uh, section there. So just practical tools on what to say or what to do, given some of these situations that you may encounter. So there's that. And I'm trying to think if there was anything else I needed to cover. If those were the, the pieces. Um, the, the piece I did want to show, because that wasn't even it, had to do with this woman making some grocery choices and having difficulty. How are you going to afford to eat fresh vegetables? Where would you get fresh vegetables like you buy? Well, there's shipments that come into the grocery stores, but the food is so expensive. And how do you find the money to pay for that? And when one person might support 10, 12 people, it's a very challenging thing to do. Your options really are limited. Well, let me see if I can find this last piece. I thought this was important. Oh, here we go. Food that we buy lasts about two weeks. We spend like $125, $175 a month for groceries at my house. You know, I've got like three teenagers, so, and it's, you know, about the end of the month, I start 